So I, um, we've introduced uh, this concept of, or we started quantifying the, these, these weekly stretch flames and the sensitivity of the flame to stretch as quantified by the Markstein number. So now we've talked a little bit about how fuel composition affects it and um, how equivalence ratio affects it. And, and, and again, all these trends are very intuitive. And, and if, if you don't quite understand it, I, I know it's a little involved and you're trying to learn and but I'm pointing at graphs at the same time. But if you go back, the direction of these curves and the overall sign, whether they're positive or negative, is something you can just sit down and just kind of figure out on your own. It's, it's not complicated. The actual value of the Markstein number is something that you actually have to do a calculation for. But just the general trends should be something quite intuitive. Um, now I want to talk for a minute about pressure effects. This is also interesting. We haven't talked about pressure yet. So maybe we'll motivate this by um, I'll show you some data. This is the flame speed. So S, D, D denotes the displacement speed. U is uh, with, respect, with respect to the reactants. This is the stretch rate, <coughs> um, uh, which is the uh, in absolute units. And what I've done is I've shown you a calculation. This is a, uh, an OPTIF calculation. Have any of you run calculations with OPTIF before? It's in the Chemkin suite, along with premix. It basically, it's a post flames. It's a really convenient calculator to quantify stretch sensitivities. Um, and what I did was we just ran the calculation. This is a hydrogen CO mixture, uh, 1, 5, 10, and 15 bar. And all of these calculations, actually, we adjusted. These are at different equivalence ratios because we adjusted the equivalence ratio so that we maintained constant unstretched flame speed. So remember that the flame speed kind of roughly goes as 1 on square to p. And so that means we're going to run the 15 bar at a higher equivalence ratio than the one bar, so that theoretically these curves should all converge to the same value. Um, <clears throat> what we've also done is we've run it over a much, over a broad range of stretch rates. And so it's kind of linear, and then you can start seeing it non-being linear, and then you actually get the whole curve bending over. And this is extinction. We'll talk about extinction next. So don't worry about that. So just focus on what's happening here. But what's, uh, I guess, what's your general observation about the Markstein length, the absolute sensitivity of the flame to stretch. How does that change with pressure? Not a trick question. It decreases. Yes, the slope of the curve drops as we go up in pressure, right? So remember the Markstein length. This is dimensional flame speed, dimensional stretch rate. And so these are related by the dimensional Markstein length. <clears throat> the Markstein length is the negative of the slope. So one atmosphere is much steeper than 15 atmospheres. So in other words, the Markstein length is dropping as I'm going up in pressure. Does anybody have any idea why that might, what's happening there? This gets to a point we have not had time to talk about yet, but we will now. Well, let's go back to this picture and um, imagine that I took this picture and I kept the same radius of curvature and I just started making the flame thinner, right? If I half the flame thickness, so then this preheat zone would be here and then I quartered it so it'd be up here. And if you start thinking about kind of the heat transfer across, remember it's this imbalance between convection and diffusion. So the, the heat transfer across the sidewalls is going to drop right as I, as I decrease the flame thickness. So I haven't got into this, but fundamentally, the, the reason the Markstein number or Markstein length is non-zero, it's fundamentally a finite flame thickness effect, that you've got to have a finite flame thickness for this imbalance to work itself out. So as pressure goes up, flames get thinner. Right? Uh, and in fact, flames thicknesses basically go as 1 on p. So this flame is 15 times thinner than that one within an order of magnitude, right? R roughly speaking. So it's a lot thinner, and so therefore the sensitivity to a given absolute value of stretch rate drops. The same. So this tells you a very important point, and it also means there's a big headache um, for applications because I'll just tell you why do flames blow off? Well, one of the reasons flames blow off 
is they locally extinguish. They can't take the local stretch. And you, you have the flame stabilizing in a region of very, very high shear. And they can't take the local stretch rate that the flame is seeing at the stabilization point. Um, but what this also tells me is that 10 atmospheres, I can take 10 times, well, yeah, it's basically 10 times as much stretch to have the same change in flame speed that I could at one bar. So the, the, why this raises a headache is suppose that you want to understand blow off in an aircraft engine at 50 bar. You know, you'd really rather not build a 50 atmosphere combustor. It takes a huge compressor and the compressor is expensive and it requires big electrical bills, and it's a pain in the neck. You'd really rather do this in, in your lab at one bar, right? But it shows you that, uh, well, you're gonna have to do a little bit of scaling because the sensitivity of a flame to stretch at 50 bar is gonna be very different than a sensitivity to stretch at one bar, and you can imagine that's gonna dramatically influence where the flame's gonna extinguish, where it's gonna blow out, and so forth. So this little curve right here has a nasty little secret in it, which is that scaling limit phenomenon in flames due to extinction um, across pressures, you got, you got to give it some thought. You can't just, what's going to happen at one atmosphere is not the same as what's going to happen at five atmospheres. And you'd say, well, can't I just divide by five? I wish, um, because as you change pressure, so does the Reynolds number, right? So the fluid mechanics, the, lo the, the local stretch rate that you're going to see is also going to change. Um, and uh, so, so it's, it, it makes the whole thing non-trivial. But bottom line is the sensitivity drops due to um, the flame getting thinner. And that, that is shown here by this plot here. This is the same, the same calculation, not data. And um, what I've done is I haven't normalized the x-axis, excuse me, the y-axis. And the reason for that is they all have the same, they have the same normalization value, 34. Um, so it wouldn't change the y-axis, it would just rescale it. Um, but what I've done is I've rescaled the x-axis and I've normalized by the unstretched flame thickness and the flame speed. Now, again, this is, doesn't change, so this just this doesn't change the curves. But this flame thickness is going to be different at each pressure. And what do you notice? Curves almost collapse on top of each other, right? So clearly shows that that change in sensitivity is a flame thickness effect. That as that flame gets thinner, it gets less and less sensitive to stretch. So as flames go up and up in as you go up and up in pressure, flames can take more and more stretch without extinguish, without, well, without being affected. And we'll, we'll talk later about being extinguished. Okay, any questions? Um, all right, well, let's, uh, let's move on to another topic here. Now I want to talk about strong stretch effects. So everything I've talked about now is weak stretch, just a little bit of a perturbation around the nominal flame structure. Now I want to talk about strong stretch, and in particular, that's going to lead us to this phenomenon of flame extinction. So we've talked about how stretch can make flames happy or sad, right? Um, but we've also, but if you stretch a flame too much, they all become sad. They, they will extinguish at some point. Um, and so that's this phenomenon of flame extinction. So let me, uh, let me first introduce a couple concepts. And I've mentioned this before, but now I'm going to get formal about it. I've, I've, one of the things that strong stretch does is it means you got to start being a little bit more careful about your definition of flame speed. All right. So th and this, I'm going to guess this is going to be a new concept. How many of you are familiar with this concept of difference between displacement and consumption speed? OK, one of you. Everyone else, you probably just thought, there's the flame speed. It's super intuitive. It's the value of the flame moves with respect to the flow. No, the world is a very ambiguous place. You know, Just look at US politics. It's just hard to know what is truth and what's not. And the same thing for flames when you strongly stretch them. Is life gets really ambiguous fast. And, um, and so one of the things we're going to have to do now is differentiate between a displacement speed and a consumption speed. So the displacement speed is the speed with which the flame is moving along its normal with respect to the flow. All right. Now, OK, that sounds like a pretty obvious definition. But let me, get, let me be a little bit more precise. It's the speed at which an ISO surface of, of your flame is moving with respect to the flow. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's suppose I have a stationary flame. Just a simple flame. This is the preheat zone. This is the 
reaction zone, one D flame, okay? So here I have my approach flow. I'll call it U unburned. What's leaving is the exhaust flow, U. I'll call that U burned. And if this is a 1D flow, what's the relationship between U burned and U unburned? Density ratio, right? So this will be times rho burned over rho unburned. So key point, flow is accelerating through the flame. Now, um, so what the displacement speed is, is it says, okay, if I take an isosurface and tell me what is the velocity of the flow with respect to the flame. Well, if the flame isn't moving, that's just what's the flow speed. So let's assume the flame is stationary for a minute, okay? So let's take this isosurface. Let's assume that this is the, where the, the kind of the flame starts. This is, if I have room temperature, 300 K reactants, this is the 300.1 degree Kelvin isotherm. This, the flame speed, the displacement speed, SD, um, defined with respect to the reactants, that's the SDU, right? Okay. So I'm sorry for all the subscripts and superscripts, but we have to get picky. We're going to have to get a little bit more persnickety here about nomenclature. So that would be the velocity of the flow with respect to the flame at the very leading edge of the flame. What do you think SDB is? Take a lucky guess. It's the velocity of the flow with respect to that isotherm right there. And if I have a 1D flame, SDB will be um, the density ratio, you know, rho burned over rho unburned bigger than SDU. Well, there's no reason, let's go nuts. I could define, there's a whole lot of isocontours, right? Why well, define it with respect to the, to the front or the back? I can define it with respect to the middle, right? The 800 degree Kelvin isotherm. I could define SD800K, right? That would be the velocity of the flow with respect to the 800K isotherm. I could define SD y o h equals whatever you know some iso some scalar isocontour the whole point is is that the that the displacement speed is you define some isosurface could be an isotherm it could be a scalar whatever and it is the velocity of the flow with respect to that isosurface that's the that's the displacement speed now what makes life interesting is the displacement speed can actually become negative, all right? So that's, that always throws people for a loop. How can the flame speed be negative? Well, the displacement speed can actually be negative, which means that the flow is moving that way with respect to an isotherm. Well, how could that happen? I'll give you two examples. Um, if you take premixed reactants and stagnate them against products, for low stretch rate, the flame will sit here, all right? And as you stretch the flame strongly enough, it'll actually pop across the stagnation line onto this side. And in that case, the flow is actually going, quote, backwards through the flame. The flame is completely getting fed by diffusion of reactants fighting the products. The displacement speed of this flame can be negative. Here's another example of a negative displacement speed. If you have a, a high enough degree of curvature of a flame, if it's positively curved, you can actually get a negative displacement speed here. Um, a third example would be if you have an unsteady flow, if you have an unsteady stretch rate, <coughs> if the flame is not quasi, if the flame isn't moving quasi steadily with the flow, if the flame starts to become out of sync with the flow, and it's you know which can happen at higher frequencies, like think thermoacoustic instabilities. The flame, a um, well, let, let me actually let, let me let me be a little bit more careful. Let me explain what I'm going to say. Suppose I have an unsteady stretch rate. So if I take this, uh, that first configuration and I have an oscillatory, what can happen is the flame thickness is changing. Okay? So the flame is getting thicker and thinner, thicker and thinner. But again, it's not going to be moving necessarily in step with the flow. So suppose I'm tracking this isotherm right here. If the flame thickness is changing, what can happen is if the flame, uh, let's see, how's this going to happen? If this isotherm is moving it that way or that way with respect to the flow? Um, I guess that way. If the flame is getting thinner as the f in such that this isotherm is moving up faster than the flow velocity is, you'll get a negative displacement speed. So you'll see this all the time when people show calculations for um, oscillatory stagnation, uh, stagnation flows. You'll actually see displacement speed swinging around negative. And um, 
Well, having a negative displacement speed is intuitively traumatizing, right? It's troubling to have a negative flame speed. And it, it, but what it also does is it kind of shows the problem that you have with actually a displacement speed definition. It's very definition dependent, and it is, um, and you get this weird result where it actually can be negative. Um, okay, so the, can, let's talk about the consumption speed. The consumption speed is actually a, uh, it's a volumetric measurement. Okay, so the displacement speed is, is actually defined with respect to a surface from the get-go. It's the velocity with respect to a surface. Um, the consumption speed is, let's take, it, it, what it says is, all right, let's take something like the heat release, the net rate of heat release integrated across the flame. The flame's a volume. What's the total heat release in the flame? And then let me just suitably normalize that volumetric quantity in such a way that I get a velocity. That's basically what a consumption speed is. So for example, if you take the energy equation, which I've, if this will be a little confusing because I've done multiple steps. Take the energy equation. If you integrate across the flame, which I've shown here as integrating from minus infinity to infinity, by doing so, all the diffusion terms go away because the diffusion terms vanish on both sides of the flame. And all you end up with is a convection term and the net heat release term. And from this, you can actually um, define then what's, you, you can come out with this definition for the consumption speed. So for example, the consumption speed defined with respect to the reactants would be the integral across the flame of the heat release, Q dot, divided by the difference between the sensible enthalpy on the products and the reactants, divided by the reactant density. That will give you, that quantity will give you a, uh, a, uh, a velocity, which, which we call the consumption speed. If we divide by rho burned, well, that would be a consumption speed defined with respect to the burned products. So this would be a consumption speed defined based on the energy equation. Integrate the energy equation, suitably normalize the heat release rate across the flame, and um, so that you get out a velocity scale. You could do the same thing for the species equation. So for example, you could take uh, the species equation for water, and you could calculate the net uh, water production rate, normalize the whole thing in such a way, and you could calculate a consumption speed defined with respect to water. And actually, that's here's what I've done. This is where I've done that. If you take the species equation, integrate it across the flame. So this would be the reaction rate of species I integrated across the flame, normalized by either the reactant or product density, and normalized by the difference between that species on the product or reactant side. That's the consumption speed. The consumption speed will not go negative because it's defined with respect to the, the whole thing. Well, it turns out that if you do the math, the unstretched consumption and displacement speeds are both the same. So this is why, except for one person, you've never heard about this or thought about this because for unstretched flames, they're the same thing. So the speed of the isotherm with respect to the flow is the same as the integrated heat release rate or integrated production rate of some species normalized with respect to a density associated with that isotherm, you get the same value. But they differ at non-zero kappa values. Okay? And just to illustrate this, just to mess with all your minds, I have a plot here. This is a calculation of, these are the conditions, five atmospheres, hydrogen, CO. So this is the flame speed, S, and this is defined with respect to the reactant. So I've always normalized by the reactant density as a function of the absolute stretch rate. And here is the displacement speed. All right. And this is the consumption speed defined with respect to the energy equation. This is the consumption speed defined with respect to the H2 radical. So uh, excuse me, the H2 species. Um, OK. So anyway, that's one kind of finite stretch rate effect, is you get a difference between the consumption speed and the displacement speed. Um, and so the question people will then like to ask me is, well, what's the right one? What should I use? And I think the point here is life gets ambiguous because the flame speed is fundamentally a surface quantity, right? It's, it's defined, it's the speed of a surface with respect to the flow or an integrated quantity. In reality, flames aren't surfaces. Flames are distributed volumes. And in particular, as you start to go to higher and higher stretch rates, where things are varying more and more rapidly through your finite flame thickness, the idea of treating something with a finite thickness as an as a infinitesimally thin sheet becomes more, raises more and more conceptual problems. So just, it's important just to understand um, your application in order to understand which one's important. So for example, if you want to understand flashback, 
you want to, it's the displacement speed would be the, the right quantity to use because the displacement speed is how fast that front is moving with respect to the flow. That's what's going to define whether you get flashback or not. If you want to know heat release per unit volume, ultimately the consumption speed is going to be something that would be, uh, would be better to use. But ultimately, again, it's just important to recognize the limitations of using the flame speed. It's a surface quantity. And it's a, it's a great general, it's a great way to boil all that chemistry and all the complex stuff going on in flames into a single number. But whenever you boil lots of things into a single number, you lose, you lose stuff. And the stuff that you lose becomes more and more important as the flame becomes more and more stretched. Okay, and now that kind of leads me into this next point, which is that you get, you can actually extinguish a flame for a high, uh, high enough stretch rate. And we're going to call that cap extinction. Cap extinction is the maximum stretch that a flame can sustain before extinguishing. So I showed you this plot before, <clears throat> which is the flame, the displacement speed as a function of the Karlovitz number. And you'll notice that all these curves stop at some Karlovitz number. You know, somewhere around between seven and nine, the way we've defined the Carlos number, they stop. And in fact, they bend over. So what you're looking at, the reason it's dashed is this is an this is a solution of the st the steady state equations, but it's an unstable solution. Um, so if you've learned about like well stirred reactors, you have there's the S curve, we have the stable and unstable branch in the, the middle. This is that middle unstable branch. So it's just kind of fun to show it. But what you see is the curve goes up, it flattens out, it starts to come down and then basically that is your extinction stretch rate. You can't take any more stretch than that. The flame will extinguish. Um, very important practical applications. Um, you know, for example, when we do blowout analysis for flames, we oftentimes use cap extinction as a way of scaling blowout limits. And it usually works really, really well. Um, so let's, uh, let's just show some examples. So first of all, pressure effects. Um, so this, this is that same data but I've just gone back to an absolute scale. So you can see that as you go up in pressure, kappa extinction goes up. And again, this is a flame thickness effect. If you make a flame thinner and thinner, you have to go to a higher and higher dimensional stretch rate to make the same effect in, in, in the same distortion of its internal structure. And this effect actually scales, as you can see from this plot here, that kappa extinction scales pretty close to pressure, pretty closely with flame thickness and which scales pretty close with pressure. So what that tells you is, is that kind of as a first order rule of thumb, pressure goes up by a factor of 10, cap extinction, at least if you're around one bar. You gotta be careful as, you, as chemistry starts changing, but you know, kind of for nominally more low pressure chemistry, it's gonna roughly scale linearly with pressure. Um, so that's the pressure effect. Uh, if we talk about fuel effects, as you might imagine that the higher the flame temperature is, the more the flame is going to be able to withstand stretch without extinguishing. And that's the case. So this is, um, here's a bunch of data. This is from the, this paper from Jackson et al. Different mixtures of methane and hydrogen. So only methane, methane, hydrogen. Increasing equivalence ratio. You can see cap extinction increasing um, with uh, equivalence ratio, at least on the lean side. Uh, what it also shows you is as you go up in hydrogen fraction, notice that you know, at a given equivalence ratio, as you go up in hydrogen fraction, the flame can withstand a lot more, a lot more positive stretch. This, um, this would be for a lean mixture. Obviously, if I was rich, it would be the other way around. But, but you know, um, <clears throat> lean, uh, lean positively stretched hydrogen. Hydrogen likes to be lean and positively stretched. Um, it can withstand a lot more stretch than uh, methane can. Um, The, uh, this is a kind of a new point. It's kind of a fun little point that I want to, want to make for you. Um, uh, here I have a calculation where I've changed the preheat temperature of the reactants. Excuse me, not, not preheat temperature of reactants. What I did is I took a methane air flame and I stagnated against hot products. Okay, so that was basically this geometry, and I started cranking up the temperature of the products here. Um, and uh, so 1350, 1400, 1450, this is the consumption speed, this is the displacement speed. So at 1350K, notice what's happening. I'm, I'm sort of on the back side. So as I'm increasing stretch rate, the flame 
the uh, consumption speed is dropping, 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 and then right there it extinguishes at 1350. Really interesting, look what happens at 1400 and 1450K. Is it actually doesn't extinguish, right? This is kind of cool. 1400K, what it does is it just continues to monotonically drop. What happens between here and here is it actually jumps across the stagnation line. Um, so if you go over to the displacement speed, notice how it drops and then bang, the displacement speed goes negative. This is where you get a negative displacement speed, a positive consumption speed, where the flame has jumped across the stagnation line here. 1450K, you see the same thing, same thing. What's kind of interesting though here is, is that um, the, uh, you actually kind of lose the phenomenon of extinction. Does it, what's, what's going on here? So remember, um, extinction and ignition are two kind of defining features of high activation energy chemistry. So again, if you think about that well-stirred reactor model problem with the S-curve, if you, if you start varying, if for low enough activation energy, you don't get an S-curve, right? You just get a, a gradual increase in temperature of the rea reactor with a dom Kohler number or with resonance time or something like that. Um, and so the, um, so low activation energy, you don't, you don't have these phenomenon of ignition extinction. High activation energy, it goes back to a point yesterday that I made where I said combustion is kind of digital in a high activation energy world. It's either zero or one, right? You either, you either have it or you don't have it. You don't kind of, you don't ha half have it. Um, that's, that's a high activation energy world. You either, either things are going to go and they're going to take off and you're going to pretty much consume all the fuel or it's just not going to happen. You're going to consume zero of the fuel. You don't have 50% fuel consumption. Um, but again, that's a high activation energy argument. So how do you decrease activation energy? Well, remember, dimensionless activation energy is Ea over Rt. So your Ea, let's assume that's not changing. But one way that you decrease the effective activation energy is you actually increase preheat temperatures. So you're, you are visually seeing here the S-curve. So this, I, if I trace the S-curve at 1350 out, it would look like this. And then this would be the ignition curve branch you're actually seeing the S-curve get stretched out, so 1400K is kind of the critical value where it becomes vertically tangent, and then it looks like that. So this is kind of a cool plot. I like it because it just shows how um, you, uh, you sort of lose the critical extinction. So I'm just, I just throw this out because in reality, in many flames where we stabilize flames, we have a lot of recirculation of hot products to help us stabilize the flame. And so this whole concept, I said, you know, I, I sort of told you earlier that, you know, flames will blow off when the local stretch rate exceeds the extinction value. But in reality, it might be a little bit more complicated than that because what happens is, is the flame might start to lift, it might start to locally extinguish, but then you start getting really hot products starting to interface with the reactants. So the flame might not have this kind of digital zero one, ex at least near the, near the attachment point behavior. So that the, the effect that, that, the fact that real combustion systems have a lot of product recirculation really I don't think we understand that. In fact, if I think about kind of really interesting problems for you to think about, for those of you who are thinking about academic careers, and I think that's, that's a really interesting one that people haven't really explored, is the, uh, some of those dynamics. Uh, the fact that you, you simply lose those, um, the, the S-curve um, because, of, because of very, very high preheating. Um, it's also an interesting effect just as we start, as we go to higher and higher pressures and temperature cycles as well as you're, you're in effect dropping your effective activation energy. Um, all right, I think I'm just gonna skip this stuff, this slide. Is there a question? Yeah. So if I was varying at fixed preheat temperature? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite following the question because if I, that's, that's, you mean sort of like this plot? Yeah, 
I don't, I don't think so. You know, if you decrease equivalence ratio at constant pressure and temperature, at some point you're going to hit extinction and um, at a given stretch rate. You know, in essence, what you're asking is if I, forget, if I drop equivalence ratio as I, when I hit this line at the stretch rate given by that value, I would, I would extinguish. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Well, it could be. It could be it's getting too lean. Um, uh, but also, I think it's important to recognize is the ideas that I gave you before were kind of weakly stretched ideas because the flame, what happens is the whole flame structure just fundamentally changes. And so you really can't, what we did before was we kind of used unstretched flame concepts to understand the effect of stretch, which is a, a weak stretch argument. But that would be one of the reasons why is it would just get, if you had, if the, if you had strong differential diffusion effects, you could get too lean or too rich. But also what, what happens is simply the fact that, particularly at high activation energies, your flame temperature is going to change and you know reaction rates are an exponential function of flame temperature and so small changes in flame temperature can cause really significant changes in reaction rate and even lead to extinction. Anyone else? Okay. All right, I'm going to skip over this slide for the sake of time. Um, let's, let's talk about edge flames now. So totally new concept, edge flames. <coughs> so, and we're going to, we'll talk about, I'll bring these back to applications at the end of today. But the idea is real flames have edges. No, no, unless you have like a spherically expanding flame, any real flame has an edge, right? So for example, you know, if you're stabilizing, this would be a flame stabilized at a rapid expansion. That flame has an edge. If I have a propagating ignition wave, you know, edge, edge. If I have a hole in the flame, I have an edge. Um, and another thing is, is that, you know, premixed flames have, they propagate. They, there's this, they have this uh, property that they propagate normal to themselves. Non-premixed flames don't propagate, but pre non-premixed edges do. Um, they move with respect to the flow. Um, and then as I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you is the velocity of the edge. So that edge um, the velocity of the edge is defined with respect to the velocity, uh, with respect to the flow. The edge velocity is not the same as the flame speed. They can be different. In fact, the edge velocity can be negative. Like if you haven't, this, if this flame, if this hole in the flame is opening up, you would have basically a negative edge speed. If this ignition wave, if this flame is starting to get bigger and bigger, the flame become, goes like that, that would be a positive edge speed. Um, so important applications of edge, edge flames is, in particular, flame stabilization of both non-premixed flames like that, or premixed flames like that, or if you have propagation of an ignition front or a flame um, propagation after extinction. Now, one thing to remember is that you have to pay attention to the observer reference frame. So for example, let me, let me illustrate this one for you. This is a picture from our lab of a Bunsen flame high equivalence ratio, low equivalence ratio. So what's not, this is linocyte chemiluminescence. So what's not obvious to you, if you took a cut through the flame on the right, what you would see is the flame would look like that. So that's an edge flame, okay? And now in a lab coordinate system, it could be stationary. But in a coordinate system with respect to the, to the flow, this would actually be a retreating because the flow is going like that, which is pulling the flame that way, but the edge velocity would basically be equal to the local tangential flow velocity of, at that point, the negative of it. So this is actually an extinction. What, what you have here is the flame is extinguishing and it's trying, one way to think about it is you can think about there's an extinction wave that's trying to propagate down the flame, but the flow is pushing, keeps pushing it back down and it kind of reaches a balance where the edge speed matches the flow speed. But anyway, that would be an example of a negative edge speed uh, a retreating flame edge that's stationary in a lab coordinate system. That's what I was trying to say here, that attention has to be paid to the observer reference frame. Um, this is a bunch of images. I put them in here, but it's really hard to see what the flame's actually doing, so um, I don't know if I'm going to talk about them. But you know, whenever you get flames near blow off in particular, you start to get a lot of local extinction and holes in the flame and there's flame edges just flapping around and doing all kinds of stuff and the world gets really complicated and ambiguous. 
uh, when, you, when you're using OH as, as your marker because <clears throat> it starts to get hard to differentiate the reaction front from an extinction front edge, um, which is why I won't talk about that. Um, I'm just going to jump over that. So let's, uh, let's go, let's look at a model problem. <laughs> so um, some of you may know John Buckmaster, um, did a lot of great work in combustion, now retired. But uh, this is a model problem that he put together to kind of illustrate some key ideas around edge flames. And um, so, and I go through this in detail in my book. Um, but so what, imagine what I have is I have an infinite reservoir of oxidizer on this side, okay? And I can somehow magically specify the temperature and the oxidizer mass fraction at this interface. And then I have an infinite reservoir of fuel on this side. And I'm gonna specify the fuel mass fraction in the and the um, temperature here. And then these will be separated by some distance L. Now, this is a, actually, in Ed Law's book, he calls this a chambered flame. He goes through this in detail, the chambered flame, a 1D chambered flame, because this is a nice problem to look at 1D non-premixed flames. So probably, I bet many of you learned about non-premixed flames from the Burke Schumann flame or something, which is fine, but the Burke Schumann flames, a 2D, 2D flame, this is 1D. So imagine that, so there is, a theor there is a solution where the flame is continuous. It goes all the way to plus infinity and minus infinity. And you can analyze the structure of it. And Ed Law does that in his book. Um, what I want to look at is that same chambered flame problem that, that Ed Law does. But imagine somehow I can magically erase the bottom half of the flame. And I only have, so the flame goes from here all the way up, but it stops there. So maybe I, I took my air compressor with nitrogen and I just blasted it at the flame right there. And what I want to know is when I turn off the nitrogen flow, what's going to happen? And because um, <clears throat> that edge could potentially keep retreating and just be, the flame could just go away, or it could just sit there, or it could advance and it could refill my whole domain. Um, okay, so in order to analyze this, what we're going to do is take a look at the energy equation. Um, so what I have here is the, um, there's the unsteady term. I threw the convection term on the right-hand side. Um, excuse me. Uh, let's see, and then I have my diffusion terms here, and I have my, wow, this didn't turn out well. This is Q times W dot fuel. Q is the heat of con conduction times the fuel. So basically, I have the unsteady energy equation where I have the accumulation term, the convection term, the diffusion term, and the heat release term. And um, notice what I've done is, let's take a look at the coordinate system. Z is going to be the direction along the flame, Z, and X is the direction normal to the flame. And um, so what, what Buckmaster did was he threw these two terms and he lumped them. These are both transverse fluxes, right? Notice this is d squared t by dx squared. It denotes the diffusion of heat normal to the flame. This denotes uh, convection of, of energy um, in, in the x direction. These are transverse fluxes. And what he did was, this equate, you can't, if, if I give you this edge, you can't solve this thing uh, analytically. But what he did was, he said, let me just model these transverse fluxes by basically a convective heat loss like term. So I'm going to cook, I'm going to make up a loss term kT, and I'm going to assume that the losses that are happening normal to the flame will be proportional to the difference between the local temperature at the flame and the, the temperature at the, at the boundary, TB. Okay, so remember TB, this is a little bit unfortunate. I called it TB. In reality, this, this looks like T burn, but in reality, this is just the temperature at this interface. So I'm gonna assume the temperature at this interface and at this interface, TA and TB is the same. So what he did was he said, let me assume that the loss is normal to the flame I can model as a coefficient times the difference between the local temperature and the temperature at the boundary t minus tb, divided by the distance between the two, L squared. So if obviously if they're closer together, if L is smaller, the transverse gradient will be higher. That term would be bigger, that term would be bigger. So try to include that there. Uh, and by doing that, then you can actually make some real progress on this. And then what we also are going to do is we're going to model the, um, the reaction rate of the fuel by this equation here. So basically an exponential term and then y fuel times y oxidizer. And, okay, so if I do that, now I can non-dimensionalize this thing. So I can come up with a bunch of 
dimensionless equation. So let me just, first of all, I'm going to set the Lewis number equal to 1. I can define a dimensionless activation energy, dimensionless temperature, dimensionless heat release rate, and a Dom Kohler number. So Dom Kohler number is important. And that's going to be a ratio of my loss term. So rho Cp L squared divided by Kt. So that is going to be, this is going to, this equation is giving me losses normal to the plane. Um, and uh, divided by a chemical time term, and that's just 1 over B. Remember, B is the uh, pre, is the uh, whatever you call that thing, the frequency factor. Um, so that's my Dom Kohler number. And if I do that, then I can write take that equation, normalize it, and I can write it in this form. <clears throat> now, notice by doing this, what I've done is. Um, if I have an edge flame, this term will be non-zero, right? This is d squared t by dz squared. So I'm, I'm, I can explicitly model my losses in the transverse direction. And really, that's what's happening when I have an edge flame. I can potentially get very large gradients transverse to the flame, in addition to the gradients that are happening normal to the flame that, are, that is always present in, a, in, an, in an edge flame. Now, the other thing that I've done, which I don't think I said explicitly was, I'm going to make a change in coordinate system. So let's assume that this, let's look for steady state solutions where this edge is moving at a speed of VF, OK? VF can be positive, VF can be negative. And what I want to do is I want to change to a coordinate system moving with VF. All right. So there's an assumption here, steady state solutions where VF is not a function of time, where VF is constant. So what this problem is going to basically collapse to is I'm, trying, I'm going to try to solve for VF. What is VF? So and then I'm going to make a change. In, so when I make that change in coordinate system, I actually lose the unsteady term because I'm going to be steady. If I'm following that edge, whether it's advancing or whether it's retreating, that edge doesn't, isn't going to be changing at time. So I end up with this equation, VF times dt dz. So this is like a convection. This looks like a convection term in this direction. And then I get that uh, the uh, diffusion term in the z direction. And then I get this other term, which is a function of the temperature and the Dom Kohler number. This function of temperature and Dom Kohler number is given by that. Okay, 1 minus t tilde plus Dom Kohler number times complicated exponential term. Okay, So some of you, if you've done well-stirred reactor analysis, they, this may actually look really familiar to you, because you actually get a very similar equation for analysis of a well-stirred reactor, where the solution of the well-stirred reactor is where this function is equal to 0. Um, anyway, so this, this is the equation. And really, kind of the, I've, we've introduced this new thing called VF, which we don't know. So what we want to do is we want to solve for VF. Um, OK, well, let's, let's first start by the solution, what the solution of this equation looks like if I have no edge. So if I have no edge, what does this equation become? Well, that term 0, that term 0. So I'm just trying to solve where this thing equals 0. So it really becomes just a flamelet equation. Um, and it becomes a flamelet equation where I have, I'm basically balancing the, well, that, that term comes from the balance between these two terms right here, right? So these, this term will go away. And I've modeled this as, a, as a, a convective heat loss type term, and then I have heat release. So basically, it looks, it's basically identical to a well stirred reactor equation because I have this, this loss term and I have this heat release term, and I'm balancing the two. Okay? And so the steady state solution with no z direction variation just becomes where that function is equal to 0. Become, like I said, this becomes the same as a steady well stirred reactor. So if you actually solve for this thing, it actually is quite simple to solve this for this where this equation equals zero as a function of Dom Kohler number. How many of you have solved this type of equation before? So I'll just tell you the trick is to not try to solve for not specify Dom Kohler number and solve for t because it's a super nonlinear equation. Rather, you specify t and solve for the Dom Kohler number because because notice it's linear in Dom Kohler number. Really, really simple to solve this thing. So you can solve for Dom Kohler number, specify T, and you can sweep through the temperatures. So what we have here is a value of 1 would be unreacted. Um, for this particular case, my dimensionless heat release term Q gives me a dimensionless temperature for equilibrium 4. And then here I'm sweeping Dom Kohler numbers. And you basically you get this S curve, right? 
the classic combustion S-curve. So if the Dom Kohler number is too low, the only solution I get is where T is, is exponentially close to 1. So that would be the on the extinction branch. If the Dom Kohler is really large, it's going to be really, really close to the equilibrium value. This would be the fully burned value. And so what happens is, is that if I and then I have these two limit values, what I call DAI and DAII, or Dom Kohler number I and II, Roman numerals. So let's say I start out here. As I drop the Dom Kohler number, what will happen is the dimensionless temperature will drop, drop, drop. And then all of a sudden, at some point, I lose this upper branch, and I'm going to fall to the lower branch. That's extinction. Similarly, if I'm increasing the Dom Kohler number, this happens. And at some point, I lose the lower branch, and I only get the upper branch. That's ignition. Um, and this S-curve occurs when your activation at E is big enough. If I set E tilde equals 0.1, this curve wouldn't have the S-curve. But you've got to have the S-curve to have ignition and extinction. But anyway, what this tells me then is I have, if I'm less than DAI, then basically no combustion wants to happen. I just want to have global extinction. I want to have global ignition. So where the, what we want to do now is I want to focus on this region in here where I get either solution. Because really, what's the flame edge? The edge is where I'm jumping between this branch and this branch. Right? So if you think about it, the flame edge is where I'm jumping from the vigorously burning solution here to the non-burning solution here. And so where you get edge flames will be in this region here. If you were down here, the whole flame would just, mat, just completely go away everywhere. If I was here, I would just the whole flame would auto-ignite everywhere. But in here, I can actually support an edge. Okay, And really, what's happening near the edge is that I'm moving between that branch and that branch. And so that, OK, so now let's talk about that. So um, what you can do is, by a little bit of trickery, um, you can actually take this equation, multiply it by the temperature, integrate from plus infinity to minus infinity. And by doing so, you end up with this equation right here for the edge flame velocity. So you'll see it's the integral between the low temperature. So what that does is it gives me a change. In, I can change in variables between um, z to temperature. So that's kind of cool, because now I have an integral from the low temperature to the high temperature of that function times dt divided by the integral of dt to d, dt dz squared. Now, <clears throat> with this edge problem, this model problem that Buckmaster developed, you can't actually analytically solve for this thing, but it's positive. So what I can do now is I can figure out the sign for what VF is, and I can also figure out where VF is going to equal 0. I can tell you if it's positive 0 or negative. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that function. So what I need to do is take that function, and I want to integrate it between my low and high temperature. So what I've done here is I've taken that function as a function of temperature. So for example, if the Dom Kohler number is 1,000, so that would be this Dom Kohler right here, that's what that function looks like. And this is just straight plotting. I just took this thing, and I plotted it versus temperature. So very, you, you can all reproduce these plots on Excel very quickly, um, because I gave you what the coefficients were. Where, or did I? Didn't I say Q, what e, Oh, yeah, yeah, there they are, e tilde and q tilde. So you can substitute those into here. Um, so I, I'm going to plot this thing versus temperature. Okay? So at a Dom Kohler number of 1,000, it looks like this. Dom Kohler number of 700, it looks like that. At a Dom Kohler number of 580, it looks like that. Um, and um, I've basically what I've done then is I've integrated between the lower branch and the upper branch, which is why you know, it always starts out uh, near, near 1. But for example, at 580, which is here, I can only integrate up to the, the upper branch, the, the, the higher temperature. But now, what I'm doing now is I'm integrating this function from t low to t high. So I'm integrating it from here to here. So at 1,000, what's the sign of the integral of that curve? Positive. And so what that tells me is I don't know what the edge velocity is, but I can tell you it's a positive edge velocity. So a Dom Kohler number, if I take a flame right there, and I were to magically wipe out the flame and then get my nitrogen jet away and say, what would happen? I would see that edge go zinging down. I'd have a positive edge velocity. Um, what about at 580? Negative. So that would tell me that if I were to extinguish the flame at this point, and then I were to that, that extinction point would just 
eventually the whole flame would go away. It's a negative edge velocity. And 700 turns out to be kind of the magic number where the VF is zero. So what that tells me then is that I can't, let me, I'm just jump to the next slide. So what I did was I just reproduced that equation and I just said that basically this one will give you a positive edge velocity, this will give you negative edge velocity. This is a, a critical value of the Dom Kohler number. So if I go back to that S curve, I already, I was looking between DA1 and DA2. I can divide it into two regions. The green region is where VF is negative, the, which would be 580. The um, tan is where VF is positive. Okay? So what I've said is between these two limits is where edge flames can exist. And what this shows is there's some pretty interesting things that happen. Is that if I'm in this region, there's two behaviors. If I'm on this side, if I'm on the brown side, if I create a hole in the flame, it's going to heal itself. It's going to propagate normal to itself at some edge velocity. If I do it here, if I create it, so if I create a, a hole in the flame here, what's going to happen? It's going to, the flame is going to go away, right? So in other words, it's possible to have a steady state solution for the flame with no edge. That's this upper branch right there, right? So if the flame is continuous, no problem, I can have the flame. But if I create a hole in it, the hole is going to grow and it's going to eventually wipe out the whole flame. So in other words, let me just turn that flow sideways for a minute. So if I have a flame and I somehow magically have no edge in it, I can, I, it's possible to have a, have a reacting solution, lots of combustion. If I were to come in and let's say run a big vortex through it, locally extinguish it, put a hole in it, what's going to happen? The flame's going to go like that and it's going to eventually wipe itself out. And then this part would go like that. So that, that would correspond to the negative edge speed. OK, so that's, just, that's, the, that's the model problem from Buckmaster. So I'll just, and it turns out that the basic ideas that he throws out, you, we see these in experiments. We see these in more complicated calculations. I, just, I like that because it shows it from a very, very simple phenomenological model. OK, well, let's, let's look at some real edge flames now. Um, so what I hear, this is kind of a, a messy slide, but if we look at non-premix flames, like I said, you can, have, you can have edge flames with premixed or non-premix flames. It turns out that if you have um, advancing fronts, and by the way, a, a, another way to think about a, an edge flame with a positive velocity would be an ignition front, right? It's, is the flame is it's losing heat at the edge, but the heat it's losing is increasing the temperature of the gases next to it to a point where it can take off. And that just keeps happening. The flame just keeps marching along, and that gives you that edge speed. So it sort of looks like the, the, the preheat zone, reaction zone, normal to a flamelet. Similar idea. Um, a retreating flame is an extinction front. So what's happening there is the flame is losing heat to the gases next to it. It's just, it's just, but it's just not enough to, to, to ignite it in the flame. And that, in turn, causes the flame to locally extinguish. And so then you get a hole. And then the point next to it loses some heat. And you just, it kind of marches along. And the whole flame just gets wiped out. So that would be a retreating flame. So how many of you have seen triple flames? We talked about those yesterday, actually. So this is a triple flame for a non-premixed flame. Um, so let me just real quickly remind you what, these look, what this looks like. Well, actually, I don't need to draw it. I got it on my slide. Um, there it is. That's a triple flame, right? So I have fuel, pure fuel, pure, pure air. Turns out the scalar dissipation rate is too high for the flame to come all the way back here. Uh, so usually you get a little bit of extinction, and that extinction causes the flame to lift. You get some premixing. So this is a rich premix branch. This is a lean premix branch. That's a non premix branch. We talked about this yesterday in the context that that curved front meant that, the, the, that it caused the local flow to diverge. It could sit in a higher velocity region. Um, but um, what you can do is that um, people study these structures then as a function of Dom Kohler number or velocity of the flame. So you will oftentimes see this triple flame structure if you have a kind of a a very robust flame. Usually that's a VF is greater than zero. What's interesting, though, is the flames, as it starts to become a, um, 
a failure wave or a, an extinction wave, what you'll see is you actually, these, these branches go away and you end up with something that looks a lot more like that or like that. These are, these are ISO, these are computed reaction rate contours. You lose the wings um, for, for retreating edge flames or uh, non-premix flames near extinction. Um, similarly, you can have premix flames, you can have edges. These are some images from Paul Ronnie. Uh, he has a nice little burner to do this. Um, these are some experimental images of non-premix flames. There you can see the, uh, the triple flame for, under, for low stretch and for high stretch. Uh, anyway, so those are just, just some different images of um, edge flames for non-premix and premix flames. Well, how fast do edge flames propagate? Um, I'll, I'll j I just want to show you some data. Now, one thing that has a big impact on edge flame velocity for non-premix flame is the density ratio across the flame. And you can kind of understand that from what I told you yesterday, which is how fast does this edge propagate? Or another way to say that would be what is, if I could stabilize the flame at steady state, what would be the velocity of the flow with respect to that flame? Well, remember we talked about how the, 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 the flame causes the flow to, to diverge. So in fact, you can, um, <clears throat> you can uh, uh, as you increase density ratio, the edge flame speed for the, the positive edge speed of non-premix flame increases. Um, and, and people see this. So for example, there's some data that I've just showed you here for the, uh, the dependence of the, um, the edge flame speed uh, delta u as a function of uh, uh, the flame speed for, for the mixture as a function of sigma rho. Sigma rho is the gas expansion ratio. It's a density ratio. Excuse me, sigma rho is, is the uh, density ratio across the flame. So for non-premix flames, the gas expansion ratio across the flame ha has, a, has a kind of a square root of sigma rho effect. That's, that's this formula here. Um, Heat loss, as you might expect, heat loss has important effects on edge flame speeds. And the reason this is important is because when you stabilize a flame, you almost always stabilize a flame near a surface, right? So if you think about these examples that I gave you, for example, one of the things about edge flames is they're often, they are often, assuming it's not extinction or ignition, but if it's, a, it's the state flame stabilization point, that flame stabilization point is often just fractions of a millimeter away from hardware, metal hardware. So in fact, it's, it's oftentimes highly non-adiabatic. In, in that model problem, we didn't look at non-adiabatic effects. But um, as you can imagine, heat loss is going to decrease edge flame speeds, potentially even cause flames to extinguish. Um, and this is just a bunch of data. This is a bunch of data from Paul Ronnie, where they're plotting edge flame speeds, VF, and it's pretty typical to normalize that by the flame speed. For no, this is for non-premix flames. Of the fuel, the, of the, the flame speed of a stoichiometric mixture um, times the square root of the density ratio across the flame. So this is showing you that edge speed as a function of dom Kohler number. So basically he's changing the, the stretch rate on the flame. And uh, so that would be these curves. And then what these other curves are for increasing stretch rate. So as you in, see, as you increase, excuse me, increasing heat loss, so as you increase the amount of heat loss, the edge speed drops, and eventually for high enough edge, high enough heat losses, you only get retreating edge flame. So the, the flame is, is, uh, is retreating. So that's pretty intuitive. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time there. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting about edge flames, if we think about extinction. Now, oftentimes when you, when you look at real flames in high turbulence intensity conditions, is you get these really strong vortices, and those long, really strong vortices cause local increases in stretch rate that can exceed the extinction stretch rate that can cause a flame to locally, um, to locally extinguish. All right? Um, but what's interesting about it is once you actually have a hole in the flame, um, the, uh, the, the um, flame position, you know, you, you basically, you, you now have an edge flame, and the edge flame is something very different than a continuous flame. So if you want to say, under what conditions will I get a hole in the flame? Well, let, actually, let's, I, this is why I drew this picture. So imagine, this is kappa, this is a profile of kappa as a function of position along a flame. So this is kappa extinguish, kappa extinction. I'll explain what kappa edge here is in a minute. Um, 
the, um, if it's a continuous flame, what's going to happen is, is that we know that flames can't withstand stretch rates bigger than cap extinction. So what's going to happen is the flame's going to extinguish at, between here and here. And that's what I'm trying to draw. So if the flame initially looks like this, I'm going to lose the flame right there. Well, as soon as I extinguish the flame, I now have a new creature, right? I have this creature called an edge flame. And so, and it's going to act differently. And in fact, what's going to happen is it turns out the flame will retreat to a point where kappa is equal to the, the, the stretch rate where the edge velocity is zero, right? And it turns out that, and I'll call that kappa edge. And kappa edge is generally less than kappa extinction. So let me just, if we go back to Buckmaster's model problem, kappa edge is normally between about a half and one of kappa extinction. So in other words, once a flame hole opens, it's actually going to continue to grow and, and sort of engulf parts of the flame that would have been able to survive that vortex if the flame was continuous. But due to the fact that when you have this edge flame, you, you, um, you, uh, you, you create these, these losses. So anyway, I guess just the, the, the bottom line there is, um, you know, edge flames have their own, again, they, they have their own dynamics and uh, they, they can be positive and negative. And what I'm going to do next now is I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about some applications and I want to talk about flame stabilization and shear layers and stagnation points for our last hour. So why don't we reconvene at 4.30.